All right, so to start us off, Michelle and Dave, you're the first couple slides, so go ahead. Please, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to talk about some things that aren't on the slide quickly. It was a long, hard trip to uh, Israel. I think we ended with a 10-hour or so flight um, from Newark. I want to comment on something on that quickly, though. There were many uh, Orthodox Jews and other Jews on the flight with us. It was a 300-seat plane, uh, 333 kind of across. And about an hour before we landed, which was going to be in the morning, all sorts of commotion, getting things out of the upper racks and everything, changing clothes, uh, shawls, all sorts of things of the tradition of theirs to pray. And so all these people praying on the plane, uh, it was just very enlightening and interesting for all of us and kind of set the stage for when we went to the Wailing Wall, for example, to, to see some of that. Um, so it was an interesting, meaningful flight over. So we got there, and here is, is, here is Israel with Jordan next to it. Um, uh, we landed in Tel Aviv, which is here, and um, then went quickly up to Caesarea when we, uh, after we landed. And I want to point out something about the map. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but... Uh, this is the, um, help me here, Gaza, <laughs> Gaza Strip, and then uh, Palestine is over here, but as you kind of heard from Jill this morning, uh, really, they really have no control over where they are living. Uh, it's really governed by uh, the rules of Israel. But anyway, we went up here to Caesarea and then um, uh, on to our hotel after that. It was a long day that day. So I can't see what's over there. Tiberius? <laughs> I can't see from the side. <laughs> well, the two people there were Gus and George, our tour guide. Yeah, I, go ahead. Okay, fine. So uh, George was our tour guide, the one on the right in this picture, or on the left in that picture. Gus was our bus driver, and they were with us for most of the trip, except for about two and a half, three days. And they were terrific really very well educated. They knew what they were talking about, yeah, mostly George, but Gus was very in, uh, encouraging and interesting and fun to greet us in the morning every day when we got home. Yep. So this is uh, the second day we were there. We stayed in a kibbutz and we uh, toured the kibbutz and someone will talk about that later. And then we went on the Sea of Galilee in this boat and we had communion which was very meaningful and really wonderful to do that with really solidified the group put us all together uh, we sang together it was wonderful um, then this the next day we went to the basilica of the annunciation up in nazareth and that is the church supposedly on the site where mary heard that she was going to have jesus so this church is only about well, it was finished in 1969, so it's a fairly new church, but they, as in everywhere in Israel, it's built on top, on top, on top, on top. So this was on top of other things, and you could go downstairs and there's a grotto that's supposedly where Miriam was. The most interesting thing about this church, I thought, was that each, many nations had their own vision of what Mary looked like. So the one up there is the United States. You can't tell really very well from that picture, but it was three-dimensional and sort of silvery and shining in the light. That was really very beautiful. This is Korea, Philippines. There was an Indian one. There was one from Japan. Uh, that was really meaningful to, to see that. And then if you went upstairs, there were stairs that had pictures uh, stained glass windows that were made from pictures that a young girl had made. So that was really interesting. Next slide. And uh, while we were in Nazareth, we first went to a faux Nazarene village where they took us around. Someone will talk about that. Then we went to lunch and we went up into the sort of old city of Nazareth. The modern Nazareth is really a, a beautiful modern city, but there's this old area with a small winding walkway and we came to this 
uh, synagogue church, which is built several layers again above what they thought was the church that Jesus was in when he was teaching and learning. Um, and when we were there, we, we sang, which is an amazing thing when you're in a very small space with very round acoustics, with a group that you're really getting to know pretty well. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. So that, that was another time that every, every place we went, we had uh, at least a couple Bible verses about it. Someone would do a small sermon. We had Glenn, we had Jill, we had Pastor John, we had Pastor Gretchen. So there were four pastors there leading us on our way and telling what we had been to. So. I want to mention one more thing about the map. Um, all my visions of, of what I read in the Bible on how it looked, nothing, nothing like that in terms of distances and things like that. But especially Bethlehem and, and, and Jerusalem are like next door. It's like Minneapolis and St. Paul just about. And I had never visioned it that way. And I never had thought about how far Jesus had to travel from Nazareth down to Jerusalem or, or, or Bethlehem. And the terrain, I had no idea how hilly, how mountainous it was. So it really, it was really enlightening. Oh, we have this one too. You want to talk about that? The Mount uh, of Beatitudes? You can, go ahead. <laughs> so this is at the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. It's uh, where the Sermon on the Mount was. So this church was, I looked it up, finished in like 1939. So again, church upon church upon church. This one has eight sides. It's octagonal, and that's each one side for each of the Beatitudes. And I think for a lot of us, it was one of our favorite places that we went to because it was early in the morning. There weren't a lot of people. It was a beautiful day. And you look out over the sea and down the hill, and it was just really very beautiful. And there was some agriculture. There were bananas growing on the side. Lots of bananas in Israel. So that was a very nice, nice place to be. I did not realize that I was going to have this opportunity. <laughs> I will tell you, I remember this distinctly. Um, Pastor Glenn is by the person in the red shirt and was doing um, our devotion for us then. It was wonderful. Honestly, we saw so much, so much every day. I can't even begin to remember the statistics and the sequence and all of that. Honestly, when Dave said how hilly it is, magnify it. <laughs> it was a challenge for me because that's a long story. But anyway, <laughs> it was hilly and steep and we went to the Church of the Multiplication, one among many churches that we saw. It was absolutely wonderful, and I'd go again if I could. And multiplication refers to what, Susan? Church of the Multiplication refers to the miracle of the five loaves and two fish. And so if you look here, as tradition says, right, this altar is built over a rock, and that where is where Jesus would have performed as tradition says, the miracle of the multiplication. We also went to the church of the primacy of St. Peter. So if you recall in scripture, Jesus has risen and then Jesus appears on a beach to Peter and says, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. They gather some fish to eat around a campfire. So this church really commemorates this. So it's, it's right on from this church to the shore. It's maybe 100 feet uh, right, o right on the Sea of Galilee. And so this is uh, commemorating where those events happen. And just to give you some idea, this is something that surprised me in terms of the geography. So we're still looking here at the Sea of Galilee. So when uh, they talked about the Mount of Beatitudes and now the Church of the Primacy of St. Peter, I'm not quite tall enough here. <clears throat> so our guide, George, said 80% of Jesus' ministry happened sort of in this 
region right here. And that was very surprising to me because, again, you just make up stories when you read the words in the Bible and you have visions and what it looks like. So primacy of St. Peter, the Church of the Multiplication, uh, the Mount of Beatitudes are all very, very, very close to each other right off of the shore here of Sea of Galilee. So most of what we're talking about, unless we're talking about Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Petra, is happening like in this area. I just want to add something too. Honestly, I did not see that I'm supposed to be saying anything. <laughs> I didn't. I, I was so impressed with the pictures. This was the third church we saw that day. One, 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 walk up the hill. But it was so peaceful. It was one of the most beautiful places we went. Outside of the church, it was all um, rocky till you got to the beach of the water. And a lot of people took their shoes off and walked in the Sea of Galilee. And it was, I didn't because I'd have so much trouble putting my shoes back on again. <laughs> But I did that in the Mediterranean Sea the first day we were there. Absolutely beautiful. Do I have another one or am I done? Oh, I do. Oh, my goodness. When we went to Capernaum, I can barely remember it, to be honest with you. It's just unbelievable. You see so much. And like Michelle said, it's one layer built on top of another. And Pastor Jill, you probably have a lot more to add to this. I'll just add a couple notes. So what's interesting about this particular site, so Capernaum is really known uh, as the town of Jesus, and uh, this structure, which uh, as Professor Matt Skinner told us from Luther Seminary, he came in and did some pre-education sessions for us, but he kind of says it's like a modern day spaceship has landed on, this, like, on these very ancient ruins. And so what we're looking at is that under this church, is still some original walls of where they believe uh, Peter lived, and, uh, and by extension that Jesus would have lived as well a little bit and for a little bit of time when he lived with Peter. So that is why this place is of particular uh, importance. And then here as you come out, then there are some other ruins that would have signified where there would have been a temple uh, and other places of importance uh, in this particular town of Capernaum. Put the, the, the lame man go down, you know, through the roof and the... Yep, and so as uh, Steve Plagans is reminding me, so if you go in this church, I didn't have a real good shot of inside the church, there is like a plexiglass uh, window right in the middle of the church where you can kind of look down, and uh, tradition says that that is where also... Uh, if you remember the story, the four friends would have lowered, uh, would have gone into the, would lowered Jesus to get into the place so that Jesus could heal the sick boy. And one more. All right, Susan is just surprised here. Anything about the baptism? I can't believe this. Is it? Oh, you said that before. <laughs> Okay, when we went through the gate, way up at the top here, into Jordan, we got a new guide and a new driver. And this man is Sammy. He was our guide for the three days, basically, that we were in Jordan. He was very good. I don't think any of us thought he was quite as good as George, but he was good and knowledgeable. So uh, we went to... Um, this place, I can't even remember exactly where it was. This man is a um, Swedish pastor who was there to greet us and explain to us that uh, this was a baptismal font. And uh, I know they said that this is where Jesus was baptized. To be honest with you, I have a hard time understanding that because of the distance involved in it, but that's what we were told. It was very interesting. He's pointing out the Jordan River, which meander, wanders and meanders all the way down here. And we're quite a ways at that point from the Sea of Galilee. And it's dried up. I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, so to Dave's point, so right here, so we're at Bethany here, and along the Jordan there are many, many baptismal sites. Right? We're not quite sure which exactly one. They all sort of claim it's, it's the baptismal site. Uh, I think that what was surprising to me and to many of us was just, I mean, you think baptism, you think beautiful, flowing, clear water, and it's, the, you know, the level is low, it's muddy, it's dirty, and you're like, oh, exactly. So partly it's like this is because now it's basically agricultural runoff. So it used to be a flowing river, uh, but now it doesn't flow anymore because it's been dammed off and blocked off. Uh, it used to be a real source of water for the country, but now because of this desalinization plant that they've built along the Mediterranean, uh, that they now use get most of their fresh water from this desalinization plant, uh, so no longer need water from like the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. So because of dam damming, uh, you know everything is just sort of bunching up, and uh, eventually perhaps this might go dry. So it's not quite what we pictured. Uh, but obviously still a very powerful uh, site where we all had the chance to remember our baptisms. And again, um, all of these baptismal sites by and large rely on missionary volunteers who want to volunteer three months, six months, a year of their time to host groups like ours uh, who are coming in and out to learn about this site. Steve and Deb who are friends of the Lorimers, who we love and live in Minnesota. You stole my thunder right there. <laughs> I didn't to anyone else to say. The top left picture is a Lutheran church, evangelical Lutheran church, at the site of, close to the baptism site. In the desert, no Basically, except for what's planted, it's pure desert, and it just stood out beautifully. And uh, close by, there are seven other, or six other, I think, churches that are there for the same purpose, Muslim, Catholic, others. And we had the opportunity to visit that church. And the bottom left one is really what that, that whole area looks like. Uh, in the center above there is a picture of the altar, and it was designed by a, I believe, a Norwegian artist. And it, it, you can see it in the lower right-hand corner, too. It, it is a beautiful work of art that depicts numerous different uh, events. In the back, it's more about... Um, Jesus and, and his life in the front, it's more about uh, the, John the Baptist, uh, Elijah, the four gospels, things of that area. But it's, it's very beautiful. The church there was, was built, I believe, in 2014. As was mentioned, the pastors from Sweden also had the chance to meet two young people, also from Sweden, who were there. Um, I guess the other, only other thing I wanted to, to mention about, about it is one of the things that I remember the pastor saying that was quite profound. He said, here is the place where uh, basically is the first kind of experience of the triune. You had Jesus, you had God speaking, and the descent of the Holy Spirit. And, and so that was a kind of a powerful uh, part of that. Anything to add? We then uh, went to Mount. Oh, <laughs> well, these look more interesting than, than they do. So maybe, uh, <laughs> uh, this is this is uh, Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is two thousand two hundred and thirty feet or two thousand three hundred and twenty feet, huh? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it is where God brought Moses to observe the promised land. Uh, basically, it is also where supposedly Moses is buried. From the top of uh, Mount Nebo, you look over the Jordan Valley into Israel. You can see the city of Jericho. And on a real clear day, you can probably even see Jerusalem. Uh, it wasn't in that in our particular in our particular case. What was interesting here is 
uh, when you think about the land of milk and honey. If you look behind Mount Nebo, it's all this desert, dry land, nothing. But when you look from the top of Mount Nebo towards Israel, it's all green. And so if you came to that spot from the desert, being in the desert for 40 years, and then you got there and you saw what was ahead of you, uh, it, it, it really was really remarkable in, in many ways. The other thing up, up there uh, is, is a kind of a cross with a serpent on it. And what that implies was it was done by an artist from uh, Italy. And part of it is the bronze snake, uh, which is from the uh, book of De Deuteronomy. And at that time, the people of wandering in the wilderness were getting tired and started to uh, complain a lot about what was occurring to them. And so, I guess God sent all kinds of poisonous snakes, and several were bit and died. And so they appealed to Moses, who, uh, who basically, and, and mentioned how they had gone astray and were asking for forgiveness. And so Moses turned a staff into a, to a bronze snake head. And from that point on, anyone who was bitten and, and observed that snake head on, on the staff uh, did not die. And the other part is the resurrection of Christ, the cross. And so together, uh, it was a beautiful, uh, beautiful statue. Anything else? <laughs> you do this one. Oh, thanks. Okay, so um, uh, after Mount Nebo, we went to the city of Jericho. And um, one thing that we saw from there was the Mount of Temptation, which tradition says is the mountain on which where Satan took Jesus up when he was in the wilderness for 40 days. Um, and, and Satan was tempting him. This is the mountain where he said, you know, throw yourself down and um, the angels will lift you up if you're really the son of God and whatnot. And one thing that we talked a lot about that came up a lot was the, the kind of the whole idea of fact versus tradition. And there were things that factually, I mean, we know Mount Nebo. Um, but this one, you know, it's the highest mountain in this area, but we don't know for sure if that's where, but you really could picture. You know, you, you got an idea of what the wilderness looked like and um, what it would have been like for Jesus to be there for 40 days. And, um, you know, it doesn't really matter if that was the exact mountain or not. Another, this picture is a picture of the Valley of the Shadow of Death, which was an actual place. It was the only entrance into, I don't know really what, but anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, it was the only way to access a certain area, and it might have been Jericho because of just where this is in the whole scheme of things. But anyway, um, because it was the only way into this one area, there, uh, travelers had to pass through there, and so a lot of thieves and robbers and whatnot would lie in wait for them, and that's how it came to be called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. So, yeah. And just as a point of geography, Jericho and where this is, we're back in the West Bank. So yep. the way that we've organized the slideshow is not necessarily how we did it in order, but we're trying to kind of do the Jesus stuff first <laughs> and then other stuff. So, so we're back in the, this is not in Jordan, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Back in the West Bank. Yep. Just a couple things about Jericho. That's where uh, Jesus passed through on his way to, to Jerusalem. Uh, it is also where he uh, did quite a bit of healing. It is also where um, the sycamore tree is that, that I can't remember his name now, climbed. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus climbed to see, to see the passage of Christ. And between Jericho and Jerusalem is also where the Good Samaritan uh, uh, took place, took place. 
And Jericho is known as the world's oldest city, and it has the oldest walled city that they've ever found. Okay, so our very first glimpse of Jerusalem came from on top of the Mount of Olives. Um, and we could see across the, is it the Kidron Valley? Um, into the old city from up um, on top of the Mount of Olives. From on top of the mountain there, then there, you can take what's referred to as the Palm Sunday Walk. This um, is likely, could have been, the road on which Jesus rode on the donkey and the crowds were, and I don't know about you, but I always picture, you know, this big wide avenue that he's riding down and the people on either sides. And really, you can see here, it's really quite a narrow, um, quite a narrow road and very, very, very steep. Uh, to the left is a huge cemetery. Um, while up there, we have found this really kind of lovely place under some trees, and we had some devotions, and then um, had an imposition of ashes because many of us had missed Palm Sunday due to weather. Did I, what did I say, Palm Sunday? Okay. I'm getting confused. Ash Wednesday, thank you. <laughs> um, and again, there's the group with the uh, Dome of the Rock and the old city of Jerusalem in the background. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. And um, I found this really powerful because this is where Jesus was betrayed and arrested. And he prayed all night here. And um, you can see this is what it looks like. We have the olive trees. And um, right next to it is the Church of Gethsemane. And inside this church is... Um, believed to have been the rock that Jesus prayed on. And in the church, they have um, up on the walls, they have the, these different um, pictures of him praying and then also for when he is arrested and betrayed and taken away. So that's... And um, right here is... Um, St. Anne's Church, right up here at St. Anne's Church. And um, this is the traditional site, uh, the home of Jesus' maternal grandparents, and also to have been um, the birthplace of Mary, Jesus' mother. And in this church, people will gather and they will sing. We went right up and sang, and that was really powerful because the acoustics there are just awesome. And um, other groups were in there singing, too. We, we all took turns. We all went up there and sang. And then we have the pools of Bethesda. And um, this is um, where um, it's a site that um, Jesus, his miraculous healing of a paralyzed man. And you can see where the pools were at one time. And then, we, and then this is the Church of the Holy um, Sepulcher. And, <clears throat> and this is, according to tradition, Jesus um, was crucified, his tomb where he was buried, and his resurrection. And I believe, um, am I correct, when the tomb is supposed to be underneath this right here? Yeah, this, this, this little um, building over here. And um, it's a really emotional place. Um, you can that people were very emotional when they were there. Yeah. And the, um, the Temple Mount right, and the Western Wall 
Um, this, the, um, the Temple Mount is kind of above the Wailing Wall. This is the Wailing Wall, and the Jewish people will go in there and they'll pray. And on one side is the men, and on the other side is the women. And they'll pray up against the, the wall. And you can see, we talk about um, in, when we're there in the Holy Land, there are always layers. Um, the older part is at the bottom, and, and you can see how the wall has changed. It's going up, and the different layers of the wall. And um, right underneath here, this is a mosque, but underneath they're supposed to be um, have built the two Jewish um, temples. And, um, and this area is very emblematic of the historic area and the struggles. So you can just feel it when you walk in. Um, because I know when we walked in, there were some Zionists that walked in with us, and they had to be, um, a person had to be walking in with them. They couldn't walk by themselves. So. Go in there. Yeah. No, no one can go in the mosque unless you're um, Muslim, only Muslim. We couldn't go in there. No, we weren't there. I'm going to uh, jump you all over the map here, but first of all, we are uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, we had a, in one of our pre-trip lectures from Professor Skinner, uh, he asked us to think uh, about what is a holy place? What is a holy place? And so, and watch out for those while we're on the trip to try to figure out what a holy place was. So arguably you could say that, well, obviously the place where Jesus was born, which we'll see in just a minute, was a holy place. The place where he died was a holy place. Well, here's the Via Della Rosa, the Trail of Tears. You could say that, that, that surely that has to be a holy place. It was the place where tradition says that he had to carry the cross from where he was condemned to where he was going to die. But um, let me kind of describe to you my impression of the Via Della Rosa. So we're in the old city of Jerusalem. We're in one of these very narrow passageways. It goes up and down. Remember the hills that Susan was talking about? Uh, very narrow, going up and down. Uh, there are uh, roads that peel off this way and that way. The whole place is lined by shops that are open to the street that are selling everything from yarmulkes to uh, Korans, and the whole place is filled with pilgrims. So, and uh, there are 35 of us. We're trying to always follow George like little ducklings wherever we go. <laughs> but this was a very crowded place. You couldn't get around people. You had to, you know, scoot around. You had to uh, watch where you're walking because uh, these are pavers on the street. This is not nice, smooth tarmac that you're walking along. So you have all of this happening, and the meanwhile, Oh, here's one of the stations of the cross. They, they had them marked on the wall. You couldn't possibly stand and contemplate that for a while because the rest of the group is way ahead of you and you had to always, you know, duck and watch and see where everybody else was because if you got lost, you were going to be lost forever <laughs> in, in old Jerusalem. So we're walking along, and there are all kinds of people that are along this way. Here's a gentleman that's carrying a cross. He's a very modern pilgrim because he also has a big camera around his neck, and he's talking in his cell phone at the same time. <laughs> Was he trading his stocks? I don't know. Was he listening to some devotional music? I don't know. But, and then uh, anybody who wants to can ask Tim afterwards why he has a pamphlet in his mouth there behind... Uh, <laughs> behind uh, th this gentleman. But I'm just trying to just point out to you that it was, to me, it just felt like a situation of chaos, but you know, that's life, you know, you could say in some ways. And you know, we're always trying to find or hope that we will find holy places within chaos. And uh, I think that one of the things that did make it holy for me was all the pilgrims that were there. You know, you saw a group along the way who had stopped with their leaders who were doing a devotion, and you could hear the French as you walked by. 
you saw some Armenians uh, going by. Uh, behind you, there might be some people from Holland. Uh, there were some um, West African folks that I saw along the way. So that, to me, that made it holy. It felt like um, we were a part of this grand uh, world congregation of Christians. <clears throat> now we're back in Bethlehem. And as I think it was uh, Dave pointed out, Bethlehem is very close to Jerusalem, and it's green. So that means we are back in the um, uh, territory of Palestine. We had to go through a uh, checkpoint to go from Jerusalem uh, to uh, Bethlehem, which was about, what, 15 or 20 miles away. <clears throat> And so here is the uh, Church of the Nativity, which is one of the older churches in Israel, I think 326, I looked it up. Constantine built this church in 326. This is the entry uh, right here. And you have to stoop down. Why? Because that's giving you a sense of hum uh, humility. And at the same time you're stooping down, you're going over steps. <laughs> I point that out just to show you that, uh, as I think Susan pointed out, uh, there were many times when this trip was a physical ordeal, where you really had to concentrate on where you were walking, uh, you're going up a hill or down a hill or stepping over something. That This is not a litigious society. You know, you couldn't have this kind of a public situation in America because uh, you'd get sued. But that doesn't, doesn't happen here. So you go through all this old stone, you're stooping down, very uh, humili uh, humili humility inducing entrance to the building and you go in and then all of a sudden, boom, wham, you're, uh, you have all of this decoration and gilt, gilt, everything is gilded with gold and you have these Christmas decorations hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> And uh, it's quite a contrast between uh, the outside and the inside. Lots of pilgrims, of course, lots of, lots of emotion, as has been pointed out in these most holy places. And uh, you, just have, you are just kind of bedazzled with what was going on inside that church. Now, we are leaving this area, and we're going to Caesarea, which is way up here on the Mediterranean coast. And uh, Caesarea is interesting. We're, we're way, uh, we're, we're kind of uh, pre-Jesus pre here because uh, Caesarea is famous because of Herod. Of course, we know of Herod as being the ruler who was uh, after Jesus as soon as he heard about the fact that he had been born and the one that was responsible for killing the babies, because he was trying to get rid of the baby Jesus. To historians, Herod is known as Herod the Great, not because of what he did to try to interfere with Jesus' life and ministry, but because of all the buildings that he made. He uh, was a ruler of Israel at the time who was trying to uh, walk the narrow path between being on Rome's side and being on the Jews' side. And to uh, his dad was buddies with Julius Caesar, and Herod himself was buddies with Mark Antony. And he wanted to impress these Romans, and he took many of the Roman ideas about building and so forth. And so here's an aqueduct right, on, right in Caesarea, which is on the uh, uh, beach at, uh, of the uh, Mediterranean Sea there. And uh, what are the Romans most famous for? One of them being their aqueducts, the way that they were able to bring water to places that didn't have water before. So Herod built that, these aqueducts. They have the classic Roman amphitheater there where they'd come and have races and whatever, they, whatever their uh, form of entertainment was back in the day. And up, up there in the right-hand corner is uh, the ruins are the ruins of uh, a very large, famous uh, palace and castle <clears throat> that he had built there. And we will also see later in the presentation he built the big fortress on the top of uh, <clears throat> Masada. So he was, he was uh, 
quite the builder. Um, <clears throat> when we were there, we had a chance to dip our feet in the Mediterranean or collect shells, which I did. We were given these crosses at the start of our pilgrimage by the local uh, travel agency of which George, uh, George, our guide, was a part. And I collected <coughs> uh, some shells there at the Mediterranean, which I strung on my cross. OK, now we're going back to the Sea of Galilee, which is way up there. And we were uh, staying at a hotel that was owned by a kibbutz. Uh, if you know what a kibbutz is, uh, in 1948, when Israel became a state, there were many people who wanted to, many Jews who wanted to leave uh, bloody Europe where many of their ancestors had been slaughtered so that they could come to a place of peace. And they uh, had these little camps in Israel, literally tented camps, and lived together in a very socialistic way. One for all and all for one. Everybody has a voice in the kinds of policies that were going to run the community and so forth. So today, after all those years, this kibbutz uh, by the uh, Sea of Galilee is still functioning, flourishing. Uh, they don't live in tents anymore. They have uh, beautiful homes there. They have schools for their children. That gentleman up in the corner there is, was our guide, and his parents were one of the first settlers in this, in this kibbutz right, right after the war. So uh, one of the very powerful features of our trip uh, to this kibbutz was a uh, Holocaust remembrance. And uh, what, what do we have here? We have uh, plaques on the ground with the names of, of people who were the relatives of the founders of this kibbutz who uh, perished in the Holocaust. The little stones that are on top of there are a classic Jewish way to remember people. You see this in Jewish graveyards as well, where any visitor just comes and, t and picks up a rock and places it, places it on the grave or places it on the plaque uh, as uh, a remembrance of that person. May, may their blessing be a, uh, may their memory be a blessing. You have the railroad tracks there to uh, remind everyone of how the Jews were rounded up and taken to the camps by rail car. And then at the end, you have the Star of David broken. Is Nancy here? You gonna come up and, this was your part, remember? Uh, <laughs> a couple of, of impressions that, you know, when, he, when he, you have an expectation of what this is gonna look like, and then when you get there, and I think some of the people have already kind of alluded to this, it's a little bit different. Uh, the, uh, you know, the Church of the Nativity, we could not get down below. There's another, two other groups, and there's a lot of talking in languages that I didn't understand, but we went over here and the other group went down before us and we were on a schedule, so we couldn't get down in there. But uh, it was a cave. And, you know, I have this picture of the stables with wood and all that stuff. That's where Jesus was, not in a cave. You know, and we went to the shepherd's field. Where do they keep their sheep? In a cave. And it makes sense. There's more caves there than there was, you know, trees and wood with which to build a stable. So that was some of my impressions. Um, Nancy, you want to talk about, about this one, this uh, Nazareth village? Sure. Uh, the Nazareth village is a uh, recreation of what Nazareth would have looked like possibly during Jesus' time. And I had um, really kind of a profound experience as I was going through and we were getting back into the time of Jesus. For some reason, um, I was back in Sunday school as a little girl. And we were making um, the, the type of houses that people who lived during Jesus' time <coughs> might have lived in. We had the little ladders to go up to the roof, and we had the little clothespin people dressed in the type of clothing that would have been worn. And somehow from there, I got to thinking about all the people who have um, influenced my faith or been part of my faith throughout my whole life. 
was really very touching to me. Um, the village, as I said, is a, um, a really multinational event, and um, it does help you with the scale. Everything was small and close together, and not necessarily like we might picture it. And as I can say to echo what Susan said, extremely hilly and rocky to climb up. In fact, much of the, of the Holy Land you know, is volcanic. And so it's kind of tough to you know, farm land because there's rocks all over the place. You know, that's what volcanoes do. That's what they leave behind. So if you get the rain, the soil that's there is actually pretty good, but it's just tough to air to, uh, to actually the guy farm. The guy, the Abraham, this guy on the left oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> he's very authentic, and he opened his mouth and he said, huh, my name is Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> so, a lot of volunteers. Yeah, he was from the deep south. <laughs> It wasn't the, again, like the stable wasn't what I expected. I didn't expect a shepherd to have a southern drawl. Uh, but it, it was all good. One thing that was interesting about this, so they, they bought the land. They knew this is kind of right where, where Jesus uh, probably grew up as a young boy. And uh, as they cleared the land, there was this great big rock, and then there was a groove through it, and then a deeper rock. And the, the guy said, any idea what this is? And, of course, we're, I don't know, just more volcanic action, who knows what this is. He said, well, this is probably where they would, if they had a vineyard, where they put the grapes in, and it was a big deal for the whole village to come out and jump on the grapes, and then the little trough is where the juice went out and was collected. And, uh, and sure enough, as they started clearing more of the rubble and the hillside and centuries of, uh, of, of dust away, they found the remnants of an old vineyard. And so it is very likely, you know, that that stone and he said when the harvest happened, this was a big deal. All right? And the whole town came out. And so it's very likely that Jesus could have jumped on those stones and, and helped squeeze out some of the juice. I, I, I wrote an email you know, to my kids every day, which will help with the Shutterfly book I eventually put together. And you see the rock. This is where you know, he, he performed the, the multiplication of the fish and the loaves or where he prayed in Gethsemane. And I would say, you know, is this actually the rock? Could have been doesn't really matter. We know what happened on that spot because as I think Michelle said, it was so many churches built upon churches built upon churches. So the spot is there. It's just covered under a lot of stuff from a couple thousand years. So the Holocaust Museum and uh, my impression of this what was kind of interesting, and many of you have probably seen the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. The ending of this one uh, was really more of the Zionist movement, which is not surprising given that this is in Jerusalem and the whole movement out in the late 40s after the World War II of, of you know, founding Israel. Uh, what I liked about this is there are trees, and I can't remember the type of tree, I probably should have done my note taking better, uh, but uh, it was trees that uh, never dropped their leaves and it was there planted in honor of people like Schindler, if you've seen the movie Schindler's List and other Gentiles that risked their own lives, in fact many of that had been killed in their efforts to save the Jews, and they had uh, memorials inside the Holocaust Museum to these people as well. Do you want to add anything to that? No, it, no, you did just fine. Thank you. I, I got a B plus from Nancy. That's good. <laughs> uh, I, I will say one thing about this. This is, you know, again in Bethlehem, and the and uh, Pastor Jill talked about this a little bit in the in the sermon today. Uh, this is a, a university there that uh, is, has Palestinian students, all young people. And it's always interesting to go on a college campus and they start looking kind of universal. College kids are college kids. But we also read a lot of stuff, you know, uh, the lemon tree and, and books like this, that this rift between the Palestinians and the Israelis that changed my worldview in many ways. Uh, and the fact that we're Americans, let's face it, the Palestine, uh, Palestinians would look at us as pro-Israel. And the Palestinians look at Israel as the oppressor, so you don't know exactly how you're going to be perceived and, and how they're going to react to you. So we had a lunch there, listened to the, uh, the dean of students, I think she was, explaining what their mission was. And then, you know, after lunch, we were able to just go outside. They had a real nice kind of little mall area. And, uh, and, and so I was, there were four Palestinian young men sitting there, and I was kind of walking by with my Coke, and, and uh, the uh, one said, well, Good morning. So I said good morning back to them. And they, they motioned me over, so I started talking with these guys. And they were really interested in finding out, where are you from? They weren't real clear on where Minnesota was, but they knew where Canada was. 
and they knew that our snow was up here. That was very impressive, too, impressive to them. So we're just talking a little bit back and forth and, and they're just really charming young guys. And then one of them said, have you been to Tel Aviv? And I said, yes, yes, we, we landed in Tel Aviv. He said, the women of Tel Aviv are wonderful, beautiful. <laughs> you know, and I thought, this is good. They're just college, they're just guys in college, you know, and it was real. In a way, it was very reassuring to me uh, to see that, that kind of situation. It, yes, it, was, it really was a pleasure just to see a, a college campus and young people having the opportunity to be in college. Um, so, thank you. So, I think one more slide, and then we'll move real quickly. This is the Palestinian refugee village, and the refugee camp was just amazing. And I actually wrote it down, so I would recommend uh, one of the professors that we met several times beforehand uh, recommended the book, The Lemon Tree. And if you haven't read it, I would strongly recommend it. I read it and then told Nancy what it was about so she could pass off that she had read it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I read three of the four books, but she got the crib notes from me uh, on those things. Had there been a test, you see. Uh, but it, the lemon tree is written by Sandy Tolan. I think that's how it's pronounced, T-O-L-A-N. And it's a story of uh, after World War II and the founding of Israel and the Zionist movement, and they, they put him in this area, and the lemon tree was in the inhabited sentence of this house in Palestine. The father had actually planted the lemon tree, and the new government, Israelis, uh, came in and said, you're out. So the whole family was kicked out, and then the Jewish family, oh, this is your house. That's just not going to end well, you see. And I think that's kind of at the root of, of the problems over there. Because we all understand this isn't, doesn't seem fair, you know. So it was a, an eye-opening experience to go through that. The streets, you can see, really narrow. And we we're all on both sides of it. And their car is going up and down pretty fast, all right. And you literally have to squeeze up against the wall and kind of turn your feet sideways so you didn't have your toes run over. Uh, but it was an amazing experience. The uh, young man that took us around he talked about, uh, you know, what life was like and showed us this place, and it's just crowds uh, of people. And, of course, the, the natural reactions you want, what, what can we do to help? And uh, are they, where are they getting money? And he said, well, they're not getting that much money uh, from America, uh, and there's also not getting much, much money from European nations. And he said the reason for that is that some of the money may end up going to Hamas. And so these other countries say, I'm not going to really donate money so you can guarantee that's not going to go to support Hamas. And so it's really a conundrum. So we said, what can we do? He said, share our story. And so in a way, I think that's what we're kind of doing here, a little bit more understanding of, of what the life was like for the Palestinians. What I didn't expect is how many people, there were 15,000 people living in this camp. Um, and among other things, water was water is a huge issue throughout this area, and we could see how all of the houses had um, cisterns. Would you say to collect the Thanks. tanks to to collect the water and everything you could possibly do to uh, conserve and make sure that you had the water you needed. Um, also, the conditions, of course, with that many people in a small area, it's it's crowded. It's um, there was garbage everywhere. It, you know, it was very sobering. Um, but anyway, that was part of my takeaway message. Yeah, the little kids are running around. I said, aren't they supposed to be in school? Well, teachers haven't been paid for a long time, so school's kind of off right now. And then, of course, you saw the garbage and Nancy referred to. Well, the garbage collectors haven't been paid either. So then he said, Palestine's a very poor nation. So it came with the shrug, and that's, that's just the way it is. So. I think is that yeah too much time survey I will just follow up a little bit um, the the young gentleman that was on the other um, it's, it's the Ibda Cultural Center and I got to thinking I just throw this out here I don't know if this is something that our church could further explore to is there any way we could Help them. I mean, I have no idea. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, as Nancy mentioned, 15,000 people live here. There's no borders, which just, I mean, I didn't know what to expect from a refugee camp, but 
I didn't expect it to be sort of in the middle of the city, but there it was, and there's no borders. Um, Israel's in charge. Um, the buildings are in danger of collapsing. There's no law enforcement there. They send, Israel will sometimes send in drones to oversee what's going on there, which I found, well, I guess maybe not that surprising, but um, anyway, just follow up on that. And then the next, do we have, now we're down at Qumran. We have dropped, I don't know, a thousand feet or more from Jerusalem down uh, we're on the way to the Dead Sea, and this is Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. There are um, ten caves, I believe, where they found them. And the one picture that's way far over there is cave number four. We got a picture of that. There's a little center there, and we had a little tour guide. Um, but um, it was fascinating to be up there. Uh, down below here is um, the Israeli Museum where the Dead Sea Scrolls, parts of them, are displayed. And that's the other picture of the... Uh, we, were, we were in there. Um, it was the Bedouin boy who found the first scrolls in 1947 when he was um, looking for one of his sheep that was lost. And he could hear it down in this cave and he threw some pebbles or something in there and it hit something that sounded strange. And uh, that's where they found the scrolls. Um, some are papyrus, most are goat skin, and they use reeds to write on them. Um, and what I found is that the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Israeli Museum, they're the oldest known copy of the Old Testament. That's one of the things I read someplace. Um, continuing on, um, we are now down, but now we're down at Masada. Oh yeah, the picture at the top. Masada is this huge bluff. We drove another hour and a half or so um, above the, the Dead Sea. It's this huge butte. I think it's about three football fields long. It's over a thousand feet high. If you have time, and energy, you can go up the snake path, which winds up the side. We chose the cable car. <laughs> it's huge, 60, 70 people in the cable car. Um, but there we are getting on the cable car, and then we're up. And this was, Herod had built a huge palace there. And at some point, the um, zealots were up there. There was about a thousand, 10 families, of a thousand people who were up there um, afraid of the, I don't complete have, have this the story, but I think they were afraid of the Romans and coming. And they survived up there, amazing. I've been here before and I just couldn't believe it. And again, there was aqueducts apparently good, you're over a thousand feet up, but they still had water coming from an aquifer and how they lived for three years, it's just amazing. Um, but the Roman soldiers built a ramp on the west side. The, it, there was 10,000 Roman soldiers that surrounded this. And you can see when you're up that high where their encampments were. There were um, the sidings that built around there. But they um, um, built this ramp up, came up, and the people up there chose to commit suicide rather than being taken hostage. And what I read was there were about five that survived, but they chose to commit suicide. And I think they drew lots as to who was going to kill who. Um, and yeah, it's way up above, like I say, it's over a thousand feet um, above the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is 1,400 feet below sea level. But, um, and there's, just desert around. The day was beautiful. Um, just, hard, well, I guess there's a few clouds, but just gorgeous. Um, just is incredible. And I think, yeah, now it is.
Well, 1,400 feet below sea level, we were at the Dead Sea, and that was the same day that we went to Qumran and Masada, and this was kind of our... Oh, sorry. I'm not used to this. Um, this was sort of the end of our day. It was our kind of relaxing, resting afternoon, because I have to say that we went, 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 went. We never stopped. It was just continuous. But the Dead Sea is pretty amazing. It, its salt content is 34%, and compare that to the ocean, which is 3.5%. So it's almost like a soup. It's really interesting. And walking, this is salt. And walking down there, it was like walking on big chunks of kosher salt. It was so strange. And then they're still demonstrating floating. And seriously, you could not not float. There was no way. I mean, you were just suspended in suspended animation, kind of. And to try to stand up was really a feat. Some of us achieved it, but it was so it was, yeah, it was. It was hard to get your feet down under yourself in order to stand up because your feet floated so, so well. Mm -hmm. I kids, it was like being a blobber. <laughs> totally was, totally was. And the, they also had an indoor pool. This was a spa, it was what, the Royal Dead Sea Hotel spa we were at. And they had an indoor pool with the same salt content so you could float in the pool too. So. And then there's Petra. My favorite, kind of my favorite. Um, Petra is, well, I'll start with this, the Seek. Um, that is the entrance into Petra. It's a natural split in the mountain. And over the years, of course, there's been water erosion and stuff. Um, it's the entrance to a city that was um, <clears throat> lived in by the Nabataean people. And they built a crazy city that was, it's so amazing I could hardly imagine. Um, in the first century, they became very, well, they originally started as Arab Bedouins. And they were, found this place and then kind of hunkered down and became farmers and tradespeople. And um, <clears throat> they had a really, all the trade routes kind of went through there. And so they were very um, wealthy and everything. Um, of course, Indiana Jones featured in there. That was what, which movie? Temple of Doom? Last or the last, last one? Crusade. Oh, The Last Crusade, okay. Oh, that's right. So there were, there were um, shops and everything up above the entrance, and this was one of the shops. And then you went down to the Seek, and you walked through the sh down the Seek, and it was like, um, well, it was like the canyons in Utah, kind of, very colorful, um, very sandy, and it was long. It was, what, a kilometer or half a mile? A mile? Okay, yeah, it was long. It was quite a walk, and it was just a gentle slope downhill all the way. And, you know, others have talked about how rigorous this trip was. Coming back out of here was really rigorous, I have to say. It was, yeah. We walked so. two and a half miles in. Yeah. Two and a half miles in. Okay, okay, yeah. It sure felt like it. Yeah. But do you have anything to add? Can you talk about the camel? Um, yeah, back one. They had, so you, when you came in, the top middle picture, that's called the Treasury. That's the building that everybody's seen pictures of in National Geographic and whatever, and which on the bottom is the Treasury as you see the whole thing. Well, they had camels waiting for people to ride, and they would just walk them around, you know, but yet you paid to have a camel ride. And guess who rode the camel? Nancy, Nancy rode the camel. It was awesome. Oh, and Julie did too on the way back. Oh, right then. Okay, that was cool. That was really fun. And um, <clears throat> the city was discovered um, by a Swiss guy in eight, in the eighteen hundreds, and he disguised himself as an Arab and bribed one of the Bedouins to bring him in to see this ancient city. And 
then it started to become known by, by people around the world. Um, and then when was the earthquake? There was an earthquake in the 80s. And the people that were displaced from the earthquake actually lived in this city, in the tombs and the caves that were, um, that were there. And then they were asked to leave ultimately because it became a UNESCO um, heritage site. So um, that's what happened there. Go ahead. Could you go back one? Yeah. All of these things that look like buildings are not really buildings. They're just carved out of the stone. When you go in the door, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just a tomb is what it is. They're built as monuments to people who have died. So the people didn't live in these structures. They were just carved tombs. Uh, carved out of the sheer rock wall, starting from the top down. They always car carved starting from the top down, so they had to kind of know where they were headed with their carving as they went down. Um, the, the Romans took over this place at a certain point, and they expanded a lot of things. One, in, one was, uh, let's see, I think this is the amphitheater. They loved amphitheaters, so they expanded that. Um, and then there's just more of these carved out tombs and some of the carved out areas were also places where people lived. Um, I didn't get to all of these. Uh, it's a lot of walking and you, once you got to basically the center of the city you could go take trails up to different places. Uh, one was called the monastery. It's just sort of a nickname for the place but it was just a carving uh, in the hillside. Another one was called the temple, and then there was the uh, treasury. So these are all just nicknames of these places. Here's uh, um, Diane Crazan on a camel. I think this is the monastery yes. right there. Yeah. And the upper one is the royal tombs. You can tell the difference between those who were important and those who are not so important because you get a little cave and you're just somebody. But you get these amazing carved tombs if you're important in some way. I'm aware of the time here, so I'm just going to uh, go quickly here. But one of our last stops was the Lutheran Church of the Redeemer in Old Town, Jerusalem, where we had the privilege to meet Pastor Megan, who's based out of Denver, I believe. And then what was really cool, about um, six weeks before we had gotten there, Pastor Sally Azar, she had just been ordained as the first Palestinian woman ever in Jerusalem. So it was a big cause for celebration, of course, uh, in that community. And for us to be, for her to be with us, who she presided over communion, uh, was very powerful. But uh, for me, this was a powerful experience because we got to hear more about uh, Palestinian Christianity from their perspective. They talked about the ELCA model of accompaniment. So our job as ELCA Lutherans is not to go to an international country and say, well, this is how we do it. These are the best practices. But they say, hey, how are you, how are you experiencing your context here? What are your needs? How can we support you in the good work that you're already doing here? And so she just made a lot of great points in terms of, you know, you meet a Palestinian Christian. And for Westerners like us, one of the first questions we might think is, oh, well, when did you convert? And the, of course, the punchline is about 2,000 years ago. <laughs> right? And so I don't know that we often think of that this is native people in their native land. And that was a really powerful point that she uh, impressed upon us. And um, yeah, I kind of want to don't give you all my points because there are all my sermon illustrations coming up. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to I'm going to hoard some of them. But what I can tell you is that you know, Pastor Megan, uh, in particular, really just talked about how we can come alongside uh, Palestinian Christians, what we can do in terms of our witness, and how there's really no peace without justice. 
And one of uh, the things that they are working on, one of the things that we can be aware of as a Western church is to uh, educate ourselves more on what is happening in terms of the geopolitical situation in the Holy Land. Some of our travelers touched upon it, and that's just, that's just really the surface, how water is used a as a political tool, uh, you know, land is used as a political tool, these boundaries and security uh, checkpoints to be a reminder, a daily reminder for Palestinians of who's in charge, who holds the cash, who holds the decision-making power, um, and uh, there are a lot of people suffering on really all sides, but particularly right now in the West Bank. Uh, there are a lot of people who are going through some difficult times. So we should be really proud that we have a presence in Jerusalem with some incredible pastors who are doing some incredible work, and I hope that we get to share more of those stories with you uh, as time permits. Yes. So, and it's important to say that we heard many, many times that this is not a religious problem. This is a government problem. This is a political problem. Yeah, I would say in the refugee camp, uh, many times we heard, we don't have a problem with Israelis. We have a problem with the Israeli government. And so that was uh, an important point that they wanted us to hear in particular. Uh, and there's just a couple slides, uh, just in terms of other experiences, right? Particularly in Jerusalem, a lot of uh, presence of armed forces, which I think was sobering and reminded us that um, it's a place of tension. And then the obligatory uh, photos of the wonderful foods uh, and just the cultural scene here. Uh, this was my personal favorite. This is called kanafa. And it's a wonderful dessert where it has a crunchy exterior and sort of a creamy interior, and it's drizzled. It's cheese in, on the inside, but then there's like a simple syrup drizzled over it, so it's sort of the savory, sweet, crunchy, soft, <laughs> heavenly food. <laughs> uh, daily meals, you might wonder. We ate a lot of pita. We had a lot of falafel. We had a lot of shawarma. I think some of our travelers may not want to eat any of those foods again for a while. Um, our meals, because we were hotel-based, were largely buffets. So buffet in the morning, buffet, um, often, buffet in the morning, buffet at night, and then often for lunch it was on the go, falafel uh, or shawarma. But so many delicious pickled vegetables, uh, a lot of delicious, um, a lot of delicious variety meats and cheeses and pickled vegetables. Uh, here, we just thought it was fun. Uh, our guide, George, was like, you know that Palestinians have a good sense of humor. If you look at their stars and bucks and square buck signs, uh, we had an opportunity, a couple of us, to go wine tasting. Uh, Professor Matt Skinner warned us in our pre-education about the St. Peter's fish, uh, and, which I thought was a lot of hullabaloo about nothing, because he said, you go there, they're going to say, do you want fish? And you're going to be expecting a filet, and what comes out is something with a head. Uh, and so. I've done enough international traveling where this doesn't scare me, but it scares Professor Matt Skinner from across the street, so uh, a bunch of us had a laugh at that when we ate that for lunch one day. Uh, so obviously we just kind of scratched the surface of what uh, we experienced, and I, like I said, I had a lot of questions for reflection, and I'm sure you have questions too. I am aware of the time, and I have to teach a First Communion class here in about 10 minutes. But I also know that next week is Palm Sunday. We are providing bagels and coffee and treats. There's no adult forum. So I would invite you, if you're interested, uh, the, to gather in the fireside room. I'd invite some of our travelers back if you're just going to be here anyway. And if any of you want to ask some follow-up questions about this trip, what was most meaningful to you? How did this impact your faith? Um, you know, what else should we be knowing about Palestinian Christian Christianity? To, I would invite you back into the fireside room next Sunday so that we can have some more of those conversations um, together because I know this was a lot of us sort of sharing with you, but we want to know what you're curious about too because part of our jobs we talked about is to be a witness to what we saw and who we talked to and the more stories we can share, uh, the better. So thank you all for your time. You're certainly welcome to mill around and talk. Um,